Today's episode is brought to you by Slater's 5050 and Tua T Fitness. Everything sequel contains explicit language. And why the fudge not, you melon farmer? Yippee Kaye, motherfuckers, we're back. This is the Everything Sequel episode, or not episode, this is the Everything Sequel podcast, excuse me. We're here talking about the Die Hard Edition. My name is Michael Chance of the How Dare You Awards. With me, as always, Mr. Tom Stewart of Lonesome Whistle Productions. Say hello, Tom. I got a fucking reindeer flying in from a fucking petting zoo. <laughs> Dennis Franz at his fucking best. That's what I say. He's a national treasure in this movie. This podcast is going to be you stopping me talking about Dennis Franz. (laughs) (laughs) Today we're talking about Die Hard 2, Die Harder, 1990. (laughs) I totally forgot that was the subtitle. (laughs) You know what's funny? It's like... That was in the title of the movie when it came out, and you can't find it anymore. It's like they kind of got rid of it, you know? Yeah. But it was Die Hard 2, Die Harder. Yeah, well, I, 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 you know, it's not the last time that, that, that there will be titling problems with this franchise. No, yeah. But we'll save that for another episode. Sure. Today is all about Die Hard 2. The 1990 sequel to 1988's Die Hard. This movie is directed by Rennie Harlan. It was the seventh highest grossing movie of 1990. Budget of 70 million. Made about 117 million in the USA. 240 worldwide. Respectable, Tom. Respectable. It's very respectable. Probably the it probably did very well in Britain uh, with that Windsor Airlines segment yeah i like that they couldn't give um, any real airplane names because airlines would not stand for that <laughs> but they did have a dig at british rail which was the national rail company at the right. time which i thought was ra- was rather amusing <laughs> that uh they were, they were just like yeah but everyone knows british rails is joke so no one's going to object to that nice <laughs> that's why you're here you always have the scoop from across the pond it was yeah, it was startlingly accurate. I usually dread those those kind of uh, British moments because they just don't do their research. Right, yeah. But uh, I don't know if Cole Meany was like whispering in Rennie Harlan's ear about British. Yeah, Rail, how nice but, is it to uh, see it's Cole actually, Meany? It's 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 a satirical accuracy. Mm-hmm. Man, he doesn't fare well in this movie either. Uh, Chief O'Brien does not uh, does not come out well. All right. Now. So we are following the continuing adventures of John McClane. He is on vacation visiting the in-laws. He is in Washington, D.C. So despite being in a different city and despite being not stuck in a building, we pretty much have uh, as close to a carbon copy of the first movie as we can get. I mean, the band is all back. And yet, Mm. Tom, this is your favorite of the sequels. You ranked them. Two, four, three, five. Yeah. I went in another direction. I said four, three, two, five. But you're not wrong. I don't think I'm wrong. I think for both of us, our rankings were razor thin. Yeah. This movie is fucking great. I love this movie. <laughs> you know, it's it's uh, what I what I really enjoy about this. It, it owns the fact it's a sequel. Completely. But it has a really strong original storyline. Yeah, uh, we get we get the return of the characters we want to come back, but we also get a whole host of new characters who are all played to perfection. Yeah, I mean, some of my favorite characters in all of the franchise are in this movie. Oh, I'm excited then. I want to know: Is it Colonel Stewart that you <laughs> love, or are you a big fan of Major Grant? I love John Amos. <laughs> I, he's, you, you, I, I, I think I had a note like what I was, uh, that I wrote like a three quarters into the movie. I'm like, there are way too many side characters in this movie, <laughs> but I don't care because they are all played to perfection. Because they're all great. The Marvin the janitor. Right. 
I mean, Carmine Lorenzo. His brother. These guys, and it, it, it got to the point where I, about a quarter of the way through the film, I was like, okay, so everyone who was in the original Die Hard is kind of off in their own little pocket of the film. Right. That has nothing to do with the main action. Um, I was like, was this movie something else that they adapted into a Die Hard? Well, that's... And when I when it got to the credits, I was like, yes, yeah, that is exactly. exactly what happened. And that's the interesting thing about this these series as a whole. Like, the original movie was based on a book. This movie yep. is based on a book. The third movie is based on just a screenplay somebody wrote that was called Simon Says. Yeah. Uh, same with uh, the fourth installment, Die Hard 4.0, yeah. as the you Brits like to call it. Um, it. It's literally not until you get to Die Hard 5 that somebody actually wrote a movie specifically for Die Hard from the beginning with Die well, Hard in mind. And yet that's where they know, fail. That, that says something about why this is so successful, yeah. I think. This is uh you you get the best of both worlds. You 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 know, you get uh you get a standalone story that is really that really works in its own right, but you also get all the pleasures of, of going back to familiar characters and situations. Mm-hmm. Um which, you know, and wh- whenever they um whenever they they try to imitate the original movie they they talk about it they they own, they own it, it yeah it's not always enough to do that but at least they're doing but they're that. trying yeah and i think you know um if, if it's kind of unapologetic in that way like yeah if, if the the other thing is I, I think if it was ever to write a book about sequels i think i would call it inversions and coincidences <laughs> because every good sequel is based on a like a an inversion and then a bunch of coincidences. And this one here is like, we've still got the bi-coastal comedy of the original that, that um, John McClane is the fish out of water cop. Uh, But this time he's the, because he's been working in LA, he is now the, um, the fish out of water LA cop in New York. Well, DC. DC. Yes. Washington. But the East coast. I get what you're saying. Um, in Dallas, yes, you're right. But he, but he is it. Yeah, East Coast, the East Coast, West Coast um, uh, clashes have uh, have flipped, and it's really nice because I, you know, as a British expat, um, that is exactly at the beginning of the movie is exactly how it would go down. I mean, you know, he's been in he's been in L.A. for like what a couple of if years, that, yeah. And they're already treating him like he is a stone cold foreigner. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it's just, I just so think you can relate. You know, it, it starts off on like that is great. You've just you've literally just flipped the script, uh, but you keep the original tension from the first movie. But you're you're just you're just doing it in an inverted yeah. way. And then there's a you just have to create a lot of series of con- a series of coincidences for everyone in the first movie to meet up again. Right. It's like by, by by the time that you, you know, are seeing William Atherton again, the character of Thornburg, who just happens yes. to be on the airplane, you're like, man, they really wedged that fucking piece into the puzzle, didn't they? But you don't mind. Yeah, like, you don't yeah. care. Like, Right. It, it, pay, it pays off because we get a sense that we're continuing, you know, that, that uh, him and, and Holly still have um, unfinished business. Right. Yeah. So we're, um, uh, you know, we're, 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 we're replaying that to some extent, but it's also, you know, it's a, it's, it's kind of bringing that character dynamic back. Mm -hmm. Um, and of course, you know, and Reginald Bell Johnson appears with his Twinkies uh, via phone. Yeah. Via phone. Had to get him in there somehow. Uh, which I think that possibly is, it possibly is pushing it too far. He mostly... You know, he gets crazily high yeah, he, he mo- yeah, it's like fourth build or something like that. <laughs> um, but he's mostly there to be there in the preview so that he can say things in the preview like, wow, when you have hunches, what is it? You know, uh, insurance, insurance companies, companies go out of business uh... or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, he has a joke about the insurance companies are gonna, um, are gonna be running scared. Or yeah, something he's like there. That. Um, it is a bit. It's a bit of a bait and switch, though. 
because it does so sort of set up the idea that he's going to be on the phone the whole time. <laughs> and he no, really isn't. Yeah. <laughs> He'll exist for those few minutes and then you will never see him again. I mean, this is the thing, like, in order to get the star of the original back, filmmakers will go to these extraordinary lengths just to have them in, like, half a scene. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right, exactly. You know, with Charlton Heston, Beneath the Planet of the Apes, um, you know, we, we they they will, if they can get them back, it doesn't matter how much they're willing to, to be, actually be in the movie. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, that, that that's where, that's where the, 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 the credibility of the movie kind of strains a little bit because why why the hell wouldn't he be calling his the cops in his precinct why would he be calling his old buddy well i just assumed he was in that precinct well, that's that's a that's also a big stretch <laughs> <laughs> you're going to assign him to that precinct <laughs> That's true. If you think he's going to be working in Little Japan, right? If you think about uh, <laughs> just the character of Paul Gleason from the first movie, like how does he allow him on the force in the first place? Yeah, it's so uh, you know the, the I guess these questions are best left uh, Un yeah. unsolved. But I, I like when they they you know he he does say at one point you know how can the same shit happen to the same guy twice, which you know is like. It's it's Looney Tunes level looking in the camera. Correct. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and they need to do that in those moments. Uh, I just think Reginald Val Johnson's a little bit of a. It's it's very misleading. It's too much of a tease because you wanted more. Well, he's he's in a lot of double acts with very similar kinds of characters in these movies, but it's not him. <laughs> it's not Al. Right. <laughs> Well, let's talk about, let's get into, you know, we'll start getting into the meat of the movie. Here are a few of my top notes. First of all, I love, because like just the year before this, Lethal Weapon 2 comes out. And it's like, <laughs> slam Lethal Weapon, have the two fall down. And the next thing you have is like this magnificent car chase, you know? No titles. Yeah. I love that this movie goes for that same thing, but goes, die hard, you know, like slam die hard, slam two. And the next thing you see is a car getting towed. I, I have that exact same note. We are straight in. There is not a second <laughs> wasted. So... The frenetic, relentless tone of this movie is set from the very it's first second of It's hysterical, man. Movie. I fucking love it. it yeah, it's great. I, I think it, it's, you know, um, they... And then they do a really nice job of... They, they give us some... You know, they tell us the story of the first movie and also what's happened in between right. in the space of about a minute. And it's it's all kind of, it's all in dialogue form. It's John complaining to, to that co the cop who's towing his car. Right, yeah. <laughs> and he just sort of tells them the story of Die Look, Hard I, I'm, to this uh, point. I, I used to be a New York cop, but now I work in LA. <laughs> uh, come on, professional courtesy. And then, then, and then they kind of get too confident with that idea is we're going to slip exposition in where you don't expect it in having the plot of the movie summed up in a news report on a TV yeah. with a naked man doing Tai Chi in front I, of it. I was just going to say, because this is my second note for the movie, this movie boldly declares what it's going to be when the villain is just doing naked Tai Chi but it, for a solid I, 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 at the time 60 I thought, to 90 seconds. To the, at the time, I was like, oh, that's great because, you know, we're getting all this exposition, but we don't feel like we're out because we're watching him. <laughs> and then later on in the film, when the dictator was on the plane, I was like, what is the plot of this movie? <laughs> I wasn't paying attention to anything because I was watching the naked guy do a I cheek. was watching the tight buns of William Sadler. <laughs> it's true. So at like a halfway, I had to rewind the mic to go back and look at that news report again because i was like wait who's doing what who's rescuing who what's he doing i lost consciousness so, you know sometimes clunky exposition is a good right thing. like like can we talk just for a quick minute uh before we take a break about william sadler and his performance in this movie like if you watch william sadler in this movie and watch him in shawshank he's the greatest mm. fucking actor living today isn't he yeah, and I, I love how I love how low key he is in the beginning. I mean, I think I think it's hilarious. Speaking of inversions, I think it's hilarious that like the the first movie was predicated around 
uh, Alan charming Rickman villain, and yeah. uh, Hans Gruber and uh, John McClane not meeting for the majority of the movie. And these and two bump John into McClane each other. John McClane straight up bumps into him. And I have a note, and one of my notes is, why the fuck is the colonel in the airport right now? Yeah. He doesn't even need to be yeah. there. He he needs to go to that outpost on the outskirts. That's his job. He literally was just there but, to bump into John McClane. I think, yeah, I think that's the purpose of it. But it's also to say, you know, uh, to say that this is going to be a different kind of movie, at least with regards to the to the uh, um, hero antagonist dynamic. They're not going to be strangers to each other. In fact, they're both aware. <laughs> they're both aware of each other's backstories. Yeah. Because uh, they're, they're both. Because that's the other great thing about this movie is now John McCain, John McCain, John <laughs> McClane. That for, that's not the last time that's different gonna happen. hero. John McClane is now a celebrity. Yeah, he he lives in. He is he is now a known person who gets mixed up in hostage crisis. <laughs> right. Yeah. He's uh. What 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 is it that uh, Colonel Stewart William Sadler says? He was a little out of his depth on Nightline or 2020 or something like that. Yeah. It's 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 so beautiful. It's such a great way to because unlike uh, at least one more of the films in these series, this doesn't need to be John McClane who's getting no, mixed up yeah. in this stuff. Yeah. But it helps that what so what helps is this idea that now he is not this wild card unknown quantity. He's the known he is entity, this celebrity yeah. uh, person who you know helps hostages and blows people up. <laughs> and it's just it's just a great it's just a great tag to have that you know everyone is is already it's just it's like oh yeah John McClane comes in blow stuff up <laughs> <laughs> but i love that he's the only one literally thinking or helping yet all day long carmine is like get the fuck out of here <laughs> like he just wants him out of that tower i mean it, you know it, it, and that tower but, is alarmingly easy to get into by the way yeah well but i think that i think there's a point later on in the movie where they cover you, it exactly you, you assume that everyone's everyone's gonna start believing everything that john mcclain says because everything he said has, has turned, turned out, out to be, be true right. yeah and carmine is still pushing yeah. back <laughs> to the point where he's like i'm just gonna arrest you you're too right about things you're making it's me starting look to bad. piss me off oh man all right well we are just getting started with die hard 2 uh we're gonna take a quick break let you listen to some fantastic ads and in a second we'll be right back stay tuned ladies and gentlemen Look, people, we're living in strange times. We know that, don't we? Of course we do. People don't even know what to do with themselves. We're getting stir crazy. Well, get outside and get yourself some great food, I say. You need to go to Slater's 5050 in Point Loma's Liberty Station. It's time to treat yourself to booze, to beer, to burgers, and more. They have their full menu, people. Their full menu, I say. How many restaurants do you know that are doing that? Most places are doing a quarter of their menu, probably. Some might be doing a half. Maybe a few have got three quarters of a menu. But Slater's 5050 has their full menu, including their signature 5050 patty. It's half ground beef. It's half ground bacon. It's 100% delicious. What more could you possibly ask? Worried about social distancing? Well, it is in place, people. Tables are separated and the staff will always be seen wearing masks. You're out of excuses. Get off your keister and come on down to Liberty Station's own Slater's 5050. Indoor dining available. Outdoor dining available. Bring the family. Bring your dog. Come enjoy the normal again. Good day to you. I said good day. And we're back. We're here talking about Die Hard 2, the 1990 sequel to Die Hard. We were just kind of catching up on the beginning of the movie, Tom. So let's talk about mm -hmm. the crux of the story. We've talked about, you know, <laughs> the exposition you had to go back and rewatch about this. This, uh, you know, that's the thing. So for me, this is sort of the weakest ideas for what the bad guys want. You know, Die Hard is like the all-time best, you know, 
we're terrorists, but really I'm just this sneaky, fantastic thief. And right. of the sequels... I, I, you know, especially having, looking back at this movie, having seen um, the third and fourth films in the series, and the fifth film in the series, actually, I was actually kind of grateful that, that these guys were what they purported to be. Uh-huh. Because there is a... Especially a Die Hard with a Vengeance. There's so much double and triple crossing and so many bl double bluffs and triple bluffs that There's I kind of like the fact that at a certain point I was like, oh, you know, they're, they're, um, you know, that they're fascists. <laughs> I mean, that's what I got for it. They, they, they. Yeah. But that's the other thing is it's not ever really explained like why any, but any of the American soldiers. Right. Have made this choice, you know. It's 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 you know that that's uh, a storyline you don't get. It's it's interesting. It's the on, the only one in which it's it's totally politically minded. There's no right. There's no financial gain, right? Anywhere in in that plan. I don't think so. I mean, yeah, ultimately, yeah. I guess you in, is you install. A, that kind of government they'll be favorable to America elsewhere, I guess, but. Um, so I like the contrast of that. Again, it's like complete inversion, and it's in the later movies. I think they start muddying that up a little bit. It's like, is he a thief? Is he a terrorist? Does it matter? Um, and in this one, I like I like the clarity of it. But you're right. You're right. There's no. Uh, there's no. Um, and this is where you know the limits of someone like Rennie Harlan is very clear. You don't get a sense of why they're doing what they're doing. Yeah, but I kind of, you know, like Rennie Harlan gets some shit, I guess, on some levels. But I, you know, I love Rennie Harlan. Cutthroat Island aside, <laughs> I love Rennie Harlan. Yeah, um, me too. And also what I like about Rennie Harlan is like in this movie, he doesn't give a shit mm. about the why. Yeah. And it kind of makes me think we don't need to give a shit. You're you know? right. Like, yeah. I think, you know, the, 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 and this is consistent throughout the movies. It's like the, the more white you are, the worse villain you are. And the more European you are, uh, the more it kind of heightens your villainy. And if you just stick to those rules, which, you know, in today's climate, not bad rules, right. not bad rules of thumb. <laughs> right. You know, I'm grateful they never went down the Islamic terrorist road that so many mo so many action movies did uh, right. later on down the line. Um, and so I, I think, you know, it's at some level, it's just a basic commentary on. Uh, I mean, it's it's kind of I suppose it's it's unnervingly anti-American. Uh, yeah, especially for a movie coming out of the 1980s. You know, it's it's sort of saying... Well, the start of a new decade, 1990. Yeah, and even compared to the first movie where the enemy was Japan and Germany, you know, classic World War II foes, um, here it's, you know, it's a homegrown terror. Yeah. That's the problem. Uh, with no sense that they're... Well, I guess they're supporting a foreign power, but the people in charge of it are the American military. Mm-hmm. So... I, I kind of I, I like that and it, it made the movie it made the movie storyline really stand out to me because okay. it was the only one in which they were actually political and of course it flips the idea around from the first movie that you think they're terrorists but they're actually thieves in this one right they are just terrorists well yeah but in this one they are considered to be thieves stealing luggage by Carmine by Dennis Franz <laughs> yeah so you have a role yeah, reversal. I, I, I... <laughs> Where they think that they're thieves, but it turns out they're terrorists. That's all his tiny mind can contemplate. Yeah, I'm just gonna. I, I'm just gonna. Can we start talking about Dennis Francis, Carmine Lorenzo, please? Oh, I can't. I just. I, I've been Go holding ahead, back please. consciously. Yeah, you start. I cannot tell you the joy that this character brings me in this performance. Oh, I'm so glad you said that because I fucking love this character so much. He's so ridiculous. In his, I mean. We're, we're what, like two, three years away from his debut as Sipowitz? Yeah. So he's basically, he, he, his, he treats his opening scene as his screen test for Sipowitz. For Sipowitz, he, yeah. He is bounding around that office with a coffee cup glued to his fingers. <laughs> I have never seen such acting, such coffee cup acting in my life. I actually wrote the same note. I was like, this guy is really drinking that fucking mug of coffee. 
like a champion, you know? And and somehow in the process of of this kind of, you know, this performance and this character, he has the most interesting character arc in the whole movie. In the whole movie, yes, completely. He's the only character who really changes. Who changes? At the end, he's ripping up the ticket. It's Christmas. I mean, you, you, you know, you know, and you know what? Like, I it's always it's always strange to me that this movie that Die Hard Two is never brought up in the Die Hard Christmas movie debate. Uh -huh. Because if you add in this movie, this is way more of a Christmas movie than Die Hard. Well, I am of the opinion, for as far as the first movie is concerned, there are people who think that it is not a Christmas poop movie, and there are people, or there are people who think it is a Christmas movie, and then there's people who are wrong. Yeah, I agree. Because that's but, a Christmas but movie. But this one just, but this really doubles down. But on it does double down on I mean, it. Yeah, absolutely. It's. Set at Christmas again. He's in a John McClane's in a Christmas sweater for a good chunk of the movie, and Carmine is the Scrooge of the story. Yeah, <laughs> he starts out as this curmudgeonly bureaucrat, and by the end of the movie, he's ripping up uh, tick parking tickets, and you know he suddenly discovered discovered the way Scrooge like. It's it's beautiful. It's it 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 can almost bring a tear to your eye. How how much he grew in this movie he's fantastic and all he had to do was uh think he was gonna die by being machine gunned down yeah. <laughs> i love in that scene by the way that there's like 43 cops who pull their gun but don't shoot mclean he is actively firing a machine gun at carmine lorenzo right. and and that, that's a great example of something that you see in a lot of movies around this time, which is what I like to call stupid people ADR. <laughs> so so John, John, McClane, John, John McClane fires um, fires a machine gun, which is full of blanks. Uh, Carmine Morenzo visibly does not die or is not wounded. Correct. And then, you know, out of nowhere, we hear a, a dub dubbed voice of John McClane saying blanks <laughs> it's like this, yeah, yeah yeah blanks yeah this is what dead. they were All firing wounded, out of there blanks. blanks I can put that together so let me ask you a couple of things about this movie like as a whole um mm. one of the notes I had was I love how filthy and violent this movie is oh yes and I love like this movie is dripping with goo it's so melodramatic <laughs> and yet it works oh yeah this movie knows what it wants to be and i love it i love how melodramatic this movie is it's the only movie in the series that does this and i just i just i just love it i love every second of how melodramatic this movie is what say you sir I, I don't I, I absolutely agree. I think it, it just really turns up it, it turns up the theatricality to eleven and it's just it's just so it's Yeah, it's going full Nigel. It it really is. It's it's so um it's so beautifully done. And I guess one one of the great things about it in terms of where the series would go from here is that you basically well, oh... you open up this bottleneck premise of Die Hard, and you start to get more mobile, right? Um, you know, we we have, and you know, if you're watching these, if you're watching these movies, you know, Die Hard is all in one building, essentially. Yeah. Uh, you know, and it just and, keeps growing. Yeah, there's something so liberating about you know the snow bike chase, or uh -huh. you know, we, we're we're starting to sort of, and you know, uh, fighting on the wing of a plane. Right. Right. And you know, this is this is the thin end. Of the wedge when it comes to where the series is going to go with fight, you know, like fight sequences on, on uh, uh, aerial vehicles. Well, I think that's one of the interesting things about this movie is that it does open up. Yeah. You know, where we're in, you know, he's got room to move around. He's not stuck just in one place. And yet you kind of have this, not the same, but like you have claustrophobic kind of moments. He does feel stuck. Yeah, at least in this one location, you know what I mean? Like the, there, it's a good, it's a, it's a good hybrid between yeah. the two, I think. Which that's I, what I, the, know, and, I, and really airports like. are really nice go between because you you can't 
go anywhere, but you can go more, you know, you can, you can spread out a little bit. Um, and I think that's really nicely done. And then you've got all everything that's going on in the plane in the air where people are actually stuck. Right. So, um, yeah, you definitely get this. This movie is all about it's about the best of both worlds in terms of, you know, uh, new, you know, a completely new film that stands alone in its own right. And then a continuation of the of the the kind of diehard formula. Yeah, and that's one of the things I really love about this movie is that this movie does, you know, yes, like this movie is bringing the band back. This movie is trying to bring everything back that you loved about Die Hard characters. Um, it's constantly referencing, like you said earlier, about how could the same shit happen to the same guy twice. Yeah. You know, it's like this movie was made with the idea that there will never be another Die Hard sequel. It's just this one. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. But, no, absolutely. There's no sense of it. Kind but of. Um, it still manages to work on its own merits as well, which to me is kind of remarkable that it could be trying to remake the first one. And hit so many marks that that one does, but still stand on its own. It's like that's a that's a high wire act, man. Yeah, and it is, and and that's why you need you every every new character has to be completely on point, and they are. Right. You know, Fred Dalton Thompson in the in the air traffic control tower, Barnes the the tech guy, uh, Marvin the right. janitor. You know, there's so there's too many of these guys, but you know, one after another. Even even comic relief grandma. At one point I remember writing down it's like it's like we have seen four different levels of police hierarchy in this movie. <laughs> and we're only an hour in. Right. We've gone from the cops on the ground the beat cops on the ground to the, the fucking Marines coming in. Yeah. So let's talk because you mentioned uh, you know, Fred Thompson's character Trudeau. Mm -hmm. There's this one moment that I like where I, I think it's after William Sadler as Colonel Stewart has crashed that airplane as an object lesson for why not to mess with them. Right. And he's sitting there saying, like, you know, no more casualties will happen if you just follow directions like blah, 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 blah. Uh, I think you see now how not to mess with us. And all of a sudden the camera just starts zooming in on Trudeau's face. Yeah. And this kind of bureaucrat who just works at an airport has this line. Try me face to face. We'll see. Yeah. And you think about William Sadler naked at the beginning, just cut <laughs> and menacing and I, <laughs> like, I would love to see that fight. I would love to see William Sadler kill him in under five seconds. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, that's, yeah, that's the thing. It's 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 even a little uh, suspect that John McClane does so well against him. Yeah, that's what true. what we know he's capable of. But yeah, I, and that, the, but that goes back, that's the kind of diehard idea, isn't it? It doesn't matter how specialized your training is, you know, a, the, a blunt instrument, a kind of happy go lucky every man is 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 the you know is the real kind of heroism here right and that was that was something that was so interesting to me especially compared to the the later movies and just bruce willis in general that he is still bruce willis from moonlighting here yeah he is the romantic lead he has this kind of ted danson quality that just completely disappears in the in later in later movies in his career, correct, he's yeah, he's kind of a romantic comedy lead, a bit like a sitcom dad. He's got all well, these. Well, he one really is playing in the first three movies. He's really playing the everyman. Yeah, you know, to a T. And then all of a sudden, he really like you shave that head, man. All of a sudden, he looks like a badass, and he becomes like he should be wearing a cape. It's this sort of gradual unraveling that we don't sort of see until the next movie of, of you know, from hero to anti-hero. But at this point, right. you know, he is still, he's still like the sitcom lead. And yeah, the, this is a, a real sense of like, I'm this, I'm this sitcom dad who's dropped into a big blood budget action flick. You know, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm going to try to survive. Yeah. 
you know, I'm a fish, it has I'm that a fish out of water, and it's uh, it's interesting. It's it's. I'm glad that we got to see that one more time because mm-hmm. I think he's even more of like a family guy in this. There's a, I mean, there's there's a great quote that 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 Paul Shears always talking about where Bruce Willis thinks his appeal is that he is this guy from Jersey and all these crazy situations, and you know, Paul Shears' point is like. He, that's not what we like about you, and I. <laughs> but I, I sort of thought well, with this movie, I'm like that. That is what I like about him at this point. Right. I like the fact that he doesn't seem like he belongs in like this this high stakes situation, uh, and that changes. But yes, at this dramatically, point, yeah, dramatically. But at this point, I, I'm still getting the feeling of like you know he's a, he's just a family guy thrown into a. Well, and this is why it's so hard for me to rank them because these are all the things that I really like about this movie, you know? Yeah. I don't know. It's it's tough. It, I, oh man, like it makes me want to change right now. Just talking about Die Hard two, I want to change my rankings. I love this movie so much. It's so great. But that would be unfair to the other ladies. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. We're gonna take a, a quick break. We're gonna take one more break, and then when we come back, ladies and gentlemen, we'll be finishing up. Die Hard 2. Stay tuned. Does the coronavirus have you feeling oogie? Have you been sitting on your couch for weeks? Nay, have you been sitting on there for months? Well, it's time for you to get back in shape. Check out 2 a T Fitness. You can find them on Instagram. You can find them on Facebook. 2 a T Fitness was started by Tina Bernard. She is ready and raring to go to help you get back into the shape you want to get into. They've got all kinds of classes. They've got outdoor in-person classes. They've got online classes if that's what you prefer. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time to get back in shape. You're going to find a variety of exercises. You're going to have strength training, cardio, weightlifting, even fun five-minute burnouts that will push you to your limits. So get off the couch, get into shape. Go ahead and check out Tua T Fitness. Tina Bernard has got you for all your needs. I know her personally. She's fantastic. You're not going to meet a better person to help you become the new you. Check it out. And we're back. We're here finishing up talking about Die Hard 2, Die Harder. Uh, you know, Tom, I was going to get to the end of the movie, but before we do, you know, we've given some love uh, to, you know, plenty of love to Dennis Franz and to uh, Bruce Willis. You know, is there anybody else you want to give love to? William Sadler, we've given love to. I, I don't know we've given enough love to John Amos and his fantastic work mm-hmm. in this movie. Love him. Um, I don't, I'm not sure the name of the actor, but uh, bon, the guy who plays Barnes, I think is great. Yes, he is great. I love that character. Um, and it's, it's nice, you know, like this is the, you know, we, we get it, We're in the kind of the peak of the black nerd era, you know, um, mm-hmm. or the, the uncool black guy sidekick trope. Yeah, but this guy is cool. He's fantastic. But exactly, I was going to say, exactly, even though he's kind of tech-minded and he's on the intellectual side, he's extremely cool, extremely good in a in a tight spot. And um, I think it's great, and it's a nice little prelude to to Zeus and where that's going to go. Um, he's right. like he's like a mixture of Zeus and and Matt from from uh, Die Hard Four Point Oh. <laughs> yeah. um, so he's like he's like a the sort of uh, the the foreshadow of sidekicks to come. I, I, I'm like I say, everyone, everyone in this movie nails their performances. Even though William Atherton and Bonnie Bedalia don't have anything much, much different from what they've done before. Yeah, Bonnie I, Bedalia, she feels a little underused, and that's a little sad. But yeah, I like the. I mean, I'm glad. I'm glad that they just dispensed with. The, and yet she's great. You know, she 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 gets the most out of what she's given. She's fantastic in yeah. it. Yeah. I think it, you know, it, it's they, they realize that there is a shelf life to having, you know, journalists be the extra dimension of the of the action film. Like we don't really see that again. Um, yeah. But we, you know, we have journalism is given a pass. Well, we kind of like we substitute that for like 
sort of the, like the, you know, we substitute it for the Rennie Harlan version of the action movie where things happen like fights, you know, where they go to this outhouse, the, the, the old church, yeah. and Bruce Willis spots a sentry, and then they have this magnificent fight. But he's like, this guy's throwing Bruce Willis into the side of buildings and over trash cans, and this does not bring out anybody else. Right. Nobody hears this, you know, and so uh, I, it's it's kind of those things that that are at the front and center of this kind of action movie. Completely, yeah, and you know it feels like a total the 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 landing light part just feels like a total afterthought of shit. I really should be doing something to save my wife. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like yeah. that. You don't. Unlike the first movie, you don't get the sense that 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 saving her is front and center of his uh, goals and objectives in this movie. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> and it is a beautiful moment, but it does feel like you know the screenwriters are like, "Oh shit, we should have him do something that will help Holly in some way." Yeah. <laughs> well, let's talk about the end of the movie. Because for me, of the sequels, this is like hands down the best ending. It's the best death of the villains. Yes. It's the best, you know, it's the yeah. the, the, the most well-written. It's, it's like everything comes together exactly as it should for the end of this movie. Saving, <laughs> of course, that this airplane is traveling down the longest runway in the history of the world. And at a, a a speed that doesn't seem to indicate it wants to take off. But other than that, the ending to this movie is so awesome. I the, yeah, that was a um, I think it is awesome. I think in the latter parts of the movie, I was getting kind of an airplane vibe uh -huh. from from just you know there was some kind of ropey, some uh, you know not not too good aerial model shots and and then you know the the the, the lady sitting next to um holly yeah. on the plane you grandma know, grandma comic relief the airplane movie but is regardless the broadest of character that, it's in like, the whole movie um yeah, exactly but uh so i was getting that kind of vibe from it but in terms of you know action and the, the fight on the wing of the plane we finally get yeah the, right. the, the tai chi is brought back into the story and even though you reference the idea of like um, <laughs> how long Bruce Willis's John McClane lasts against that guy, you know, I mean, he is a cop, he is a tough guy, like he certainly would have some training. Yeah. But I like the idea that, yeah, he gets his shots in, but for the most part, he's getting his ass kicked, and he should get his ass kicked. Right. Well, yeah, I mean, that's it. You know, it's it's less about him. It's about him withstanding. Right beatings really that's john mcclain's uh talent uh it's like how bloody can he get and right. still be able to put up a fight you know and no one's expect and again that's why you know he's the he's the underdog character he's the plucky right. underdog character at this point you know he, he hasn't learned how to jump off the wing of a fighter jet onto a freeway yet not yet but it's a coming. But it's a coming. At this, you know, and I guess there's there's a greater sense of peril with that. I mean, we we're pretty sure he's not going to die, but we know he's going to get pretty badly uh, mangled, right? Because we that's what we want to see. We we needs to take that sweater off, get into a vest, get you know beaten within his an white inch shirt of his has life. to become you know olive green. Yeah, <laughs> with sweat, we, sweat and grime. We need to get all that. But this, like, the, the ending is, like, so wrapped up perfectly in this with, like, falling off the plane, you know, lights the lights the, the fuel on fire, plane blows up. That's what the planes can use to land. Like, all of that is just fantastic. Yeah. One note I did find in, in my research, though, was that, what was it? It was uh, jet fuel has a lower flash point than gasoline. And so, in fact, you could stick a lighter right in it, and it wouldn't light on fire. Yeah. So, <laughs> I would love the idea of him just like yippee ki yay, motherfucker, and puts it down, and nothing happens, and he's like, oh, oh, oh no, <laughs> and they just go off. And you see, that feels like something that might actually happen in Die Hard with a Vengeance. Like I can imagine that happening, <laughs> you know, like f f as a gag in that. But it's not something I think Rennie Harlan would ever no. consider. Plus, I mean. Putting that aside, reality aside, it's great. 
It's such a great, fantastic, yippee ki motherfucker, light it. The the shot of the fire coming up to the plane right right as it's taking yeah. off. Oh, it's just fantastic. It is fantastic. And, you know, it's, um, it's I believe, Industrial Light and Magic do some fabulous matte painting work yeah. here. And it's just like, it's like looking into a, a time capsule of, you know, certain kinds of effects that were only around at a certain time. It does time. look strange uh, at the end, though, when they have, like, clearly what's paintings or models surrounded by people walking around as the yeah, credits I, roll, I, you, you know? know? I, <laughs> even though those have kind of dated, they've dated in a really beautiful golden way where I kind of look at them as, as I look at Ray Harryhausen films where I'm like, yeah, obviously this doesn't look like it's representing the thing it's supposed to be, but it's beautiful. But it's wonderful. Yeah. All right. We're it's gonna... a really good painting of some planes. <laughs> All right, that's it, ladies and gentlemen. That is Die Hard 2. Please, if you have something to say, if you think we've missed something, if you want to check in with us, you find us on uh, Facebook, find us on the Insta, find us on Twitter. We are the Everything Sequel Podcast. Tune in to us, and uh, you might just have your fantastic comment read on air here. Tom, anything before we leave? We'll be back with a vengeance. Yeah, we will. That's it for now. Be good, everybody. Until next time.